Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland and Forest Nicaelga for the kind invitation to speak here today on the origin of the fauna. I am very grateful as well to Dr. Liam Andrews, who will be talking about the Belfast connections of the fauna next week, for his generous advice and assistance with regard to sources. Essentially, on fauna, the fauna is a badge in the form of a ring which has been worn on the lapel of our address by many Irish speakers since its introduction in 1916, a century ago. Indeed, the creation of the fauna 100 years ago this year is yet another centenary event worthy of being remembered and commemorated in 2016. While the fauna itself is the particular focus of our interest today, and this is an example that are not too easy to see, that's Peter Spacey, you know, might be on that wearing a fauna on a uniform, army uniform. While the fauna itself is the particular focus of our interest today, I think it's worth noting at the outset that it really has twin origins. The first point of origin arises from the more general phenomenon. It is common to all badges and emblems and may well be found in one form or another in all human societies. The second point of origin is that of the particular social and cultural environment which arose out of the language and literary revival movements in Ireland from about 1890 onwards and came to a head. 1916. Therefore, there's no harm to remind ourselves that the fauna is a particular instance of a much more general and widespread phenomenon common to humanity across the world, probably at all times and in all places. Now, this is the phenomenon whereby people wear uniforms, hats, t shirts, sashes, wristbands, medals, and badges of all kinds to publicly express membership of a particular community or group and or an allegiance to an ideal. Indeed, hair or beard style can perform this function just as well. You only have to think of the beards worn by Orthodox clergy, Greek and Russian, which is fundamentalists of Jewish or Muslim persuasion. Tattoos, indeed, even facial ones and all over body tattoos are currently in vogue. At a practical level, being identified by uniform can make sense for an army, although this also has its disadvantages, which has led to camouflage to try to offset some of these. Football and other sports teams will wear a common uniform, although boxers need only to be identified by the supporters of opponents rigged out in blue versus red colours. Many of us will remember when what we used to call blue boiler suits seemed to be the dedicated dress for all and sundry in the mouth of St. Thomas, China. Now, the religious fear, as long ago as St. Patrick, um, he was reputed to have what was called an as um, tonsure or hairstyle, now as is a sort of an axe in a straight line, so the as tonsure might be something across the front of the head, but it was a way his head was shorn in a way that he was recognisable. And he was referred to them as untoiled on the as head. Um, we are more familiar, of course, with the dress of Franciscan monks and nuns, the Pope wears clothes, decided to set him apart from all others, so therefore we can see that Orthodox Jews skull caps, six turbans, Muslim men's beards, and women, Muslim women's burqas and hijabs all carry a message. As do more run of the mill uniforms for army personnel, bus and train workers, bank officials, grammar school students, and university, graduates, football supporters, and so forth. Now, turning to badges and such like one as passports, identity cards, emblems of all kinds, temporary ones such as those worn on daffodil days, Easter lilies, poppies, or some semi permanent ones such as trade union badges. Pioneer temperance pins, white white star, can swear you and so forth. And since this latter category, that the fauna fits. Now, if we turn to the second strand of origin, the Irish language dimension, this gained momentum after the founding of the Gaelic League in 9 Lower O'Connell Street, then Sackville Street, Dublin, on the 31st of July 1893, with the first Belfast branch being established just two years later, 1895. Now, the founding of the Gaelic League had been inspired by a famous lecture delivered on the 25th of November 1892 by Dr. Douglas Hyde, and this was delivered to the National Literary Society in Dublin. In this, he argued for the promotion of the Irish language and for the preservation and continuation of the use of the place names, personal names, music, and games native to Ireland. With regard to dress and outward appearance, Hyde had this to say. Why have we discarded our own comfortable frieze? Why does every man in Connemara wear homemade and homespun tweed, while in the Midland counties we become too proud for it? Though we are not too proud to buy at every fair and market the most incongruous cast-offs, cast-off clothes reported from English cities and to wear them, 
Gretel's as far as we have any influence, set our faces against this aping of English ways and encourage our women to spin and our men to wear comfortable free suits of their own wool, free from shoddy and humbug. Now it's only lately that I realise that shoddy is actually a noun here, but I come back to it, it's not. not it. However, one would expect that the founding and spread of the Gaelic League, after all it grew rapidly and had 800 branches by 1908, would have, that it would have had a similar impact. Now it did have membership cards, of course, some of them very attractive, but these are essentially bureaucratic, uh, they have a bureaucratic function. Uh, the League didn't have a uniform as such, but three clothes may have served that function for many and in the eyes of more. In fact, there is evidence from Dr. Hyde's first visit to Wexford in 1898 as president of the Gaelic League that he practiced what he preached. And Hyde is the second on the left there. Hyde was in Wexford, this is taken when he was in Wexford. Hyde was in Wexford to attend the establishment of a branch of the League and Angela Burke's 2004 book on Maeve Brennan includes the following account of Hyde's impact on Maeve's father, Robert, or Bob as he was known, who was later secretary of the Irish legation in Washington in the 1930s. And this is Angela Burke's account. Bob Brennan was 17 when the celebrations marking the centenary of the 1798 rebellion swept through Exford. At 18, he was among the group that welcomed Douglas Hyde to Exford and became one of the first members of the Gaelic League branch that was founded there soon after. On that first visit to Exford, Hyde's tire at first dismayed and even embarrassed his hosts. Instead of the carefully groomed, spectacled professor we had expected, we saw a big, wide-shouldered man carelessly dressed in homespuns and wearing a tweed cap, said Bob. This was his first encounter, Bob Brown's first encounter, with the Irish Ireland campaign for the use of Irish-made cloth. Tweeds were worn by gentlemen in the country at that time, but not in town, where gradations of respectability were scrupulously noted. At the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, however, weavers from County Donegal had been a central feature of the Irish village, organised by Ishbel Lady Aberdeen, wife of the former Viceroy. The promotion of Irish cottage industries was an objective that nationalists shared with Vice Regal Society in Dublin. Now, everything he wore was Irish, Dr. Hyde pronounced proudly as he and Bob walked through Wexford's narrow streets, and Bob marvelled that he gave no indication of noticing, this is a quote, the ridicule which attended his course. So people, it was obviously a novelty for people to see somebody wearing tweed in town. Even the speech Hyde gave that evening had a tweedy flavour, according to Angela Burke, who's obviously wax, well, again, caught up in the theme. And she said that Hyde drew a, con a contrast between heroic Gaelic Ireland of the past and the shoddy, English-speaking Ireland of the present. The English textile mills, whose low-cost fabrics endangered the Irish woolen industry, had given the propagandists a word that would run and run. Shoddy was recycled fibre, woven together with new wool in English mills to produce a cheaper textile. Shoddy imported goods became a catchphrase of the Irish Ireland movement, turning colonialist rhetoric against the coloniser and managing to suggest low standards in all spheres of English and English-dominated life, from mass production to sexual morality. Now, ten years on, the situation had changed dramatically because the Enniscorthy Echo was now carrying an advertisement which said, to look a man, an Irishman, you must be dressed in native tweed. If you wear Carly's Bridge tweed, which they're advertising, you will realise the warmth of homegrown wool and the value of homespun tweed. Now, apart from the all-over tweed look, there was, of course, the question of the kilt. Mostly regarded as an import from Scotland, it was largely confined to males engaged in public performances of dancing on stage, and even then was worn more by young boys rather than young men. Now, the kilt was regularly worn by a small number of often ascendancy types, such as Lord Ashburn and Shane Leslie, and regularly by Claude Chavas, Gullet Christ of Blaine, and a small number of others. Lord Ashburn was a fervent Irish cultural revivalist and prominent member of the Gaelic League, whose cultural and religious views had caused him to be largely disinherited by his father, Having become interested in Irish while studying at Trinity College, he became president of the Gaelic League in London. He was said to have been a familiar figure in London, where 
he used to wear a distinctive kilt and cloak, uh, pinned at the shoulder with a large brooch. A eulogy in the Catholic Herald after his death in 1942 told readers that Ashburn, quote, always wore the kilted Irish dress and was a picturesque figure. His green kilt, green stockings and belt, with massive silver buckle, always created unusual interest. Before the last war, Lord Ashford created a mild sensation by appearing in the House of Lords in kilts and speaking in Gaelic. Another interesting individual was Claude Albert Charas, who was born in Oxford on the 2nd of April, 1885. His father was Albert Sidney Charas, uh, Professor of Classics and a Fellow of the University, University uh, College, Oxford. Claude seemed to have been interested in Irish culture from an early age. Uh, he was a, still studying in Oxford in 1916. He followed his sister Marguerite to Eichel. Um, she was setting up a lace school and he uh, became involved in Skull Ocala. In 1925, Shabazz was a secretary of the Nakara branch of Conrad Gaelia in Galway. He had become a well-known figure around the city because of his way of dress. He wore a saffron kilt and cloak. He was an avid Irish speaker and refused to speak English. At one time, while in Cork, he was fined five pounds by a McCroom court for speaking Irish to a police constable. Rather than pay the fine, he spent two nights in jail and he was elected at the Galway Representative for Sinn Féin, the Ordesh, in 1949, under the name Clwyd de Kelsa. <coughs> Shane Leslie, the father of Jack Leslie, who died lately, you might have known. He was the father, maybe grandfather. Um, came from Castle Leslie, Las Loch, County Monaghan. His Irishness took various forms. Uh, for example, he wore the Irish kilt, asserting the trousers were an English invention. Gilda Priesto Brin was another kilt wearer, as was Thomas Ollis himself, where, who we find kitted out in the uniform of the Lusk Black Raven Band. Now, Going to the establishment on Foyle itself, we have good evidence for it, and most of the accounts are more or less consistent. And what was exactly was the more immediate motivation for this initiative? Now, Paul O'Shea has written a fine 700 page book on Sheila Spaisley, entitled On Paisley, and he explains much of the background, and I've uh, drawn a lot on him. In a way, the Foyle can be seen as a result of an ebb and flow. And, ebb, and part of the ebb and flow of Gaelic War activities, a reaction against the calm after the storm. Because the Gaelic League campaign for Irish as an essential or compulsory subject for matriculation in the new National University of Ireland had been a resounding success. The campaign had brought 100,000 people onto the streets of Dublin in support on the 19th of September 1909. The campaign had persuaded Dublin Corporation and many other uh, county councils to make scholarships for students in the new institution dependent on the NUI accepting this pivotal role for Irish. The students would not be made, the scholarships would not be made available unless and until Irish was an obligatory subject for entry to the National University. The campaign had also involved the League in successfully facing down the Catholic hierarchy. The rule for essential Irish in the matriculation examination was implemented from 1913 onwards. Uh, but as I think as Shakespeare says in some form or other, it's not a direct quote, all things that are with more pleasure chase than uh, enjoyed. The battle was over, victory was the Gaelic Leagues, but at the end of the day, the effect of the measure was limited and long term rather than immediate. After all, only 5% of the population were attending a secondary school at the time, never mind going on to university. The League had been doing its best since 1893 to promote the learning and use of Irish. But the publication of the 1911 census figures showed that the decline in the number of Irish speakers was continuing, particularly in the Gaeltha. So this is true of Dunyall, Connacht and Munster. This had a debilitating effect on the morale of Gaelic leaders down through the ranks. Everybody likes to see successful outputs for their efforts. Even more insidious was the effect of the militarisation of society. Reacting to Carson's Ulster volunteers, Owen McNeill, the very man who had prompted the founding of the Gaelic League, uh, now wrote the North began, ironically in the Gaelic League's own paper, and played such, and the energies of young men and women switched focus to the Irish volunteers, and then of course Redmond's national volunteers split from that later, and then you had to come on the man as well. So military activities were now taking precedence over cultural engagement and interest in language revival and change. 
I don't know if anybody noticed that there was an incident in Cork there in the last week or two where a native or a speaker from the Kerry Gwelsoch left his employment because he said he wasn't uh, being allowed to speak Irish because English was the uh, language of the establishment. But here I have an example of the same thing comes from 1913, November 1913, and no less a person than Sean McDermott told a meeting in Wynn's Hotel that they should turn to English as there were some present with little Irish and that English was the working language of the Irish volunteers. So the IRB had essentially taken control of the Gaelic League at the Dundalk Ordesh in 1915, getting their people elected onto the Executive Committee, that is, of Cushtagano, and having a crucial motion passed which declared that the League was now in favour of an independent state, a free Irish nation. Douglas Hyde interpreted the connotations of Sayre, free, as a repudiation of his own long-standing and fundamental non-party, non-sectarian approach and resigned the presidency on health grounds. So sometimes you can go from presidency on health grounds. <laughs> yeah. However, no one was appointed in his place until Owen McNeill took on the job after the Easter 1916 rising and he was out of prison more than a year later. The IRB had had its way. But in the event, it had rendered the Gaelic League both headless and rudderless. When all this was taken together, the penny had now dropped for some. For example, in 1915, Baisley had had to concede, I have noted with regret that the immersion in volunteer work has tended to diminish the habit of speaking Irish among Gaels in Dublin. Because of the activities of the Gaelic League since 1893, again, there were plenty of people with a smattering of Irish, but there was a relatively small number who had achieved fluency. The problem, as some dedicated people saw it, was how to get those who had fluent Irish to speak it to each other. After all, the social norm was, and is essentially, that a group of Irish speakers would switch to English if they were joined by someone who didn't have fluent Irish. So Irish needed to be spoken more. It was just two months on then from the climax of the Dundalk or Vesh that Piers Paisley made his initial proposal for a new scheme to promote the widespread speaking of Irish in Dublin in an article entitled An Irish Speaking League. Now I have been looking at that hundred times before a penny dropped for me. You know, we have the Gaelic League, now we have it. It's an Irish speaking league, so he's setting up an opposition. This is the thing you should, because I say that only occurred to me yesterday. <laughs> um, published in the Leader on the 30th of October 1915. He proposed that an organisation be established whose members would wear a badge, for instance, a small white flag, painting the word Gaelic, and vow that they would only speak Irish at least one evening a week. So the league must be worked in divisions. There must be one for each week night and one for Sundays. The members, for instance, of the Monday division, Drown and Lumen, shall return from work and business each Monday evening, dawn, the badge, and other that. From that time to the following morning, they must regard themselves as a pleasure to speak and write nothing but Irish. My scheme provides that every day of the week, a number of Irish speakers were wearing conspicuous bags from circulates from Dublin, demonstrating generally that Irish is a living reality in our capital. So, you know, obviously didn't stay at home in Dublin in 1916, because there wasn't any really TV or even radio, so people were out and about, and the home wasn't too good either, because you were probably in lodgings or something. So, and they might, they're probably against drinking in pubs as well. So. As, eventually envisaged there, as initially envisaged, therefore, the scheme must be geographically confined to Dublin and only involved commitment by individuals for one, one evening in the week. Now it seems likely that there was a fair amount of informal discussion about this proposal among Gaelic League members at various branches of the organisation in Dublin over the next few months. At any rate, members of North Cray, the central branch of the League, were invited to move on to a meeting in Oris and Gates, you know, <coughs> the building of the Keating branch on the 10th of February 1916. The bill, this building was located in North Frederick Street, 18. It was agreed by those present that a Society for Irish Speakers should be founded, and Colin O'Murrahu proposed that it be called Unfoyne Gaelach. But that title was amended to the simpler Unfoyne, so this is the organisation's title now. And this was done on the advice of Dear Mother Hagerty and Owen O'Lochroin. O'Murrahu himself was the only person present who opposed the amendment, so he wasn't for moving. He still thought his idea was a good idea. 27 people took the final pledge as members that night. So there were a lot more people present then than there were at the founding of the Gaelic League, only nine or something, ten. Right. So. And the Fonia pledge goes as follows. 
Der Wien und der Welt zu fest, der Krieg, der Hemd in der Hände der Gemeinde, ach, wo ein, wo wir gehen, wie der Traditional committee was set up. Ten members on the executive. Greg Yor, you were well used to organizations at this stage. Oh, sorry, I want to. That's the, that's the punchline. I'll come back. Mm -hmm. I'll I read this and I'll give it back to you in a second. We come back to the. Anyway, Basley was appointed as president. Crew Walla, Padre McGinley as vice president. Lee Maureen as secretary. Tygo Scanlon and Lee Maureen as members. Um, although the matter of an envelope was discussed, those present on this first night had no idea what sort of badge would be suitable and the decision was left to the committee. Basley's recollection is that it was Tygo Scano who subsequently thought of the fauna as an emblem. A moment of inspiration, Basley felt. It was decided that the symbol would be just be a yellow ring without any decoration on it and a pin in it to attach it to a coat or tie. Price of one shilling, but if someone wants to have one in gold, it will of course be more expensive. Now copies of all the fauna could be had by purchasing them from Lee Maureen at the Gaelic League headquarters. But as we know, she notes, and we've already observed, the establishment of the fine was tantamount to admitting that the Gaelic League itself had failed to get people to speak Irish, and that a new approach was needed, or not enough people to speak Irish, or whatever. Um, now, Baisley waxed eloquent on the subject, uh, still in February 1916, uh, building further on the metaphorical potential of the concept of a fine or a ring or circle. I trust that the sound of our own tongue will soon be more frequently heard in Dublin. I trust that the movement will spread through the Galtot and through the Gaeltot until the Great Yori form one big ring around Ireland holding the historic Irish nation together. Now, um, do we have the final pledge there? We do, yeah. So now we just look at the end, please. Achawain or they go off in Lesh, except when there is a special need for it. Now, of course, this is the $64,000 question, when is the special need? So if you had that problem, Lee Maureen was your man. He was able to explain what you did. Your cat thought he had enough, ach, why, your vet gone over where a file, that she could have got us, the girl at Lord and the Great and come toward Vosche. As a bit of shame, Lord and Fear, the cat thought on the corner, she mad in the fucking. So if you were in danger of death, you were during some occasion when you were speaking Irish, <laughs> Um, there was a letter which you could speak English, but you had to remove your phone, yeah, and presumably you had to have a pocket, and you had to put your phone in the pot. So much for being in danger of death, did you? <laughs> so, the phone therefore needed a pot, he was going to speak the King's English, and the life or death situation. So, obviously, these people. Well, about 1916 were made of stern stuff. Of course, now a lot of the other things, apart from the fauna, were on their, people had a lot of other things on their mind in the spring of 1916, the little matter of the rising on Easter Monday, 25th of April 1916. At any rate, the rising played havoc with the early establishment of the fauna organisation, as you can imagine, and its name, say, the emblem. Not only was Faramonia, as Paisley became known in prison, not available to promote the new venture because he was one of the several thousand who found themselves in prisons across the water as he was incarcerated, but so was Lee Maureen, the secretary of the organisation. And now there was the first meeting of the Fawn after the rising took place on the 23rd of June 1916. I was informed that Maureen was in Stafford Prison and that the organisation's files were missing as they had been seized by the police during the raid. Now, following his release from Liverpool prison, actually, he's actually from Liverpool, basically uh, was from Liverpool, parents, his parents were from, at least his father was from Kerry. Uh, basically attended a reception in his honour on the 7th of July 1917, held by members of Unfoyne in the Gaelic League headquarters in Dublin to welcome him home. Basically addressed the gathering. While in prison, he told his listeners he had spent much time thinking about his native land, the state of Irish, and especially the work of the Fauna. Furthermore, though it had taken him a long time to get information from the outside, when it did come, he said it was a great comfort to him to learn that the work of the fauna was continuing. Now, interestingly, when he had a chance to uh, assess, assess the... My own pocket is giving trouble.
Okay, let's go back to that. Okay. Um, when he later had a chance to assess the situation after returning to Dublin from prison, basically declared that he found the fauna to be flourishing, and this meant there were 300 members, he said. Now, nothing stands still, and in an editorial in Fauna and Lay, the Gaelic League's paper with the title at that time, in the beginning of 1918, Bailey now proposed that there be what he called Down of Fauna, a Fauna Sunday, uh, where the enthusiastic Fauna bearers would make a further promise. Well, that's the committee I mentioned. Um, the Fauna is Dihili and Aaron. So they could wear another emblem. Sorry, find it plus one or something. There may have been a danger of one of the lapels setting up. <laughs> Basie also had another worry. At an early stage, I saw with anxiety that the Fawny badge was exercising a fatal fascination on learners whose fluency and knowledge were very far from that. They regard the fawn as a medal won in an examination or contest. It may be argued that this was a good thing, that learners of Irish were encouraged to persevere by this means, but this was not the object for which the organisation was started, nor the kind of membership we aimed at. Now, there's no doubt that it was this sort of thinking that prompted down the Fáinne. The initial idea was to have a sun such a Sunday once a month and once every three months. By providence or design, a lot of the Paul's meetings had to be held back, and the first such Sunday took place, I think it was on the, the 1st of September 1980. A special badge was prepared, a small flag with long Gaelicke on it. And afterwards, Bailey wrote optimistically, I'll just translate this now, a small group can make a big change to their own lives and to the lives of others if they have enough courage and strength of will. The Fáinne people of the Fáinne are a small insignificant group in comparison to all the people in Ireland, but it is probable that some of the most courageous people and those of strongest will are connected with the Fáinne. We are relying on the likes of them. It is they who will free Irish from danger of death. Now, basically regarded the 1st of September in 1918 as just the start, and went on to suggest an hour of Irish every day and an Irish day every week. Kurgos, Narvan Queen of doing Urikli Gaelic events, Tha Nagan Lay. Tha Sulagong or Gargan Meg Law Gaelic events, Tha For instance, wouldn't it be a good idea them to have an hour of Irish every day? We hope that we will soon have an Irish day every week. Horth Cord and Oina decided to have Law and Gaelic every month. Now, one of the main drivers and the reasons why the fine actually became successful was that it was given as uh, one of the, the Timory, the organisers who apparently were still available from Colin de Bay, the Gaelic League, it was added to their duties, and one of their duties was to um, propagate the use of the fauna, which they obviously did successfully. Now, unfortunately, with regard to this part of the world, it was reported that progress in Ulster was non-existent, and of 14 branches called Gostra, registered by January 1919, none was said to be in that province. Now I understand from the managers that that's not quite true. But anyway, by, in, by May 1919, there were signs that Law McGuilga was not altogether successful. Some members didn't like the badge. Others had commitments which were impacting on their pledges. Um, and finally, on Lay's rejoinder to this was that a half day of Irish was better than a whole day of English. Now you can see um, that a backdrop as to how the things were progressing. The Fáinne organisation held annual meetings called Rachthus. And it's from these that we'll get the various statistics. Now, um, six people, six members could form a Gloucester group. Now, Baisley argued against what he termed ornamentalism uh, and for Irish to be a healthy, living, growing language, saying, There are those who have never been able to get away from the old idea of the Irish language as something venerable, picturesque, ornamental and apart, and those who desire to see it a living reality in the everyday lives uh, of the modernised people of today. So we can see there's a wide spectrum of attachment to the language and ability in it. And in a way, this is sort of, the, I think, the back, one of the other reasons for the point is that in the very beginning, everybody was at the same standard, they didn't have any Irish, but obviously as some people progress more and more, they leave others behind. Now, 
the spectrum would run from those for whom Irish is only an ornament, a symbol, something extra, <coughs> something external. Those for whom the Fáni was a sign of accomplishment, of having learned Irish to a very high and exacting standard, an end in itself really, and those who wanted to speak Irish with, the, with other fluent speakers, and for whom the Fáni was a means to this end, not an end in itself. Now, there was another category though, and the interesting one of wolves in sheep's clothing. Orthodox Fáinne holders were alerted to this danger and warned not to be fooled. Ma caster bai gyor arav, na fwy lahne gyver, na bi a gynamad un tri vi gyv as, a ko bjog is a vech a gyv as pier lor. Is mo pi leir, pi leir, agus blachtra gwil behil dige. Gwil mwyr gyr gwyd blachtra oer de Fáinne man in robe, agus gwyn te dal tiempel agus an Fáinne ar chas oer gige. So if you meet an Irish speaker whom you do not know, don't trust him too much. Not any more than you want an English speaker. Many peers and detectives have Irish. We hear that a certain detective stole the phone and bad robe, that he goes around with the phone on his coat. Now, a success such as that of the phone instituted in 1916 usually flushes precursors out of the woods who claim, well, that was my idea, success has a hundred fathers, as they say. And this is actually the case with regards the badge to be worn by Irish speakers. There are accounts of three or four earlier pre-1916 attempts to introduce an emblem for Irish speakers. However, only one of these schemes seems to be well documented, that is Crown Anna. Let me mention the others first. The earliest of the proposals was the one apparently called Railt Olish. The following account from a correspondent using the pen name Farmer, entitled Concern the, the article in the leader now, this was published on the 4th of March 1916, which is the month after the Fáinne was founded. So, no sooner was the Fáinne, it was actually, we had this idea years and years ago. Uh, and he explains, interesting though, the explanation. A former claim to, I don't know who he is, right? Anyway, I don't yet know who he is, anyway. To have, he said he proposed, it might be in the minutes of the convent, I haven't had a lot of chance to look at it. He claimed to have proposed such a plan to the Gaelic League's Executive Committee in 1904. And this is what he said. It was put for approval before the Krish to Ganova, but for some mysterious reason failed to get it. The Mayo County Council of the League took it up and had a badge which was called the Ray Thodish, manufactured for the purpose. I remember seeing Dr. Akai and other leaguers wear the badge, and I thought that the days of the revival of the Irish language were at hand. Yet again, we're different. But an unkind fate took me out of Ireland for a few years, and when I returned, the Ray Thodish was forgotten. The principal reason why the plan failed was a mechanical defect in the manufacture of the badge. In designing the badge, I aimed at producing an article that it would be difficult to lose. I therefore raised it in such a way that it could be sewn onto the coat. And begin, I lose some of the details myself here, so maybe something mm. help me. But the manufacturer mistook the buttonholes for a piece of ornamentation on the back and left them out. So I'm not sure the buttonholes were on the, the badge. He himself substituted a method of attachment that broke off easily, with the result that the badges were all lost in the short time. <laughs> Next, number two. Early in 1911, a leprechaun, which is the, the pen name of Sean O'Queeve, even O'Queeve's other grandfather, uh, described an initiative in the weekly Freeman. In other words, this was 1911 now, this actually is before the Fines Institution. Another effort has been made to get an Irish speaker's badge adopted. Another, he said, to be worn by Irish speakers, the latest move is being made by the Students' National Literary <coughs> Society, a body composed of university and other students in Dublin. At the last meeting of the society, it was decided to adopt such a badge for use by members who are Irish speakers. Number three, Sean O'Keefe went on to mention the two further attempts, the second of which was the Irish speakers badge adopted in Dublin several years ago and now worn by many Irish speakers. <coughs> This badge had the words Laurium Chang and Ngayam, I speak the language of the Gaels on it, and he O'Creeve continued. The badge is available only to those who undertake to speak Irish only to Irish speakers. And in order to ensure that the undertaking would be carried out, discrimination was exercised in the issuing of the badge. It could only be had through some recognised channel, such as the committee of a Gaelic League branch, or a body such as the Students National Literary Society. This very pretty badge, made by Messrs. Johnson of Grafton Street, it contains enamels of two colours, green and white, and bears the inscription, Laurium Changa Minoya. The badge may suit the requirements of the Students' National Society. 
number four now. The other example cited by Sean O'Queen is the best documented of these early initiatives. The Crown Ethna Society was named after the mother of St. Colum Killen. This society was established in Donegal in 1909 by Dr. Patrick O'Donnell, Bishop of Rathole, in order to promote Irish. Members pledged themselves to speak Irish for one hour each day and had a distinguishing emblem, more like a medal than a badge. This was known as Bound Crown Ethna and had the name of the society engraved on one side and the inscription Changa Nehera Lower Ehne Grilge Lenathlin. So this was the language of Ireland, and Ehne spoke Irish to her children on the other. Now, um, Paul de Gesso Shield has written a comprehensive biography of Dr. O'Donnell, and he gives a clear account of how it's all started in Donegal. The Fesh of Teelan in 1909 was a historic event. And that it was on this occasion that Bishop O'Donnell made the announcement that he intended to set up his own version of the Gaelic League. And this organisation would be known as Crown Ehne. He also made reference to the Medal of Ehne, the mother of Columba. Crown Ehne was therefore formally inaugurated when the autumn session of the College of the Four Masters took place at St. Eugen's College at Kenny on the 16th of August 1909. These include the award of the Ehne Medal to people who would be prepared to speak Irish for at least one hour per day. It had been envisaged that each congregation would enrol the heads of families who made Irish their household language for one hour per day. It was also considered desirable that a small tablet be hung up in the living room, which would indicate the extent of the actual practice of the particular family as regards to speaking Irish. <coughs> so you came into the sitting room and you, you looked at the wall and you saw we speak X amount of mm -hmm. Irish a day in this house. Now, not only that, but there was another organisation called Crave Ruin of Aelke, operating in parts of Ulster about the year 1911. It too had its own badge and a vow, and we have this information from Emil Melissa. The vow was, I now promise and place myself under binding pledges not to speak English in any or any other language except the sweet Irish any time I should be talking to the person with this Crave Ruin of Aelke, Galavanish, now, according to um, Marisa, this was a semi-secret body which functioned in the lens of Antrim in St. Malachy's College in Derry, sorry, in St. Malachy's College in, in Belfast and in Derry with varying degrees of success. And you're trying to work out what are the links between <laughs> Lens of Antrim, St. Malachy's College in Derry, you'd be better at that than I would, I'm sure. Um, the badge itself was a special kind of button. On well, recent reports, the society was still active to a certain degree in March 1916. However, the value of a semi secret society, encompassing with an identifying emblem, to, which was trying to encourage the wider use of the Irish language, is not immediately <laughs> evident. If you throw those three things together, a secret society, identify it by a badge, and. <laughs> Um, now, Pierce Daisy had recognised at the outset, he never claimed that the uh, fauna was new, was new. He said simply it's an adaptation of schemes that have worked in success elsewhere. Now, in fact, prior to the deeds of those trying to promote Irish in a largely anglicised environment after the language shift from Irish to English, when most people in over half the country spoke mainly Irish, there were other demands. Um, needs going in the opposite direction, and they too brought their solutions. One traveller, so when most of the country spoke, or most of the western half of the country anyway, spoke Irish, obviously it would be helpful for travellers who didn't know Irish to know who spoke English. So there was a way to help that. One traveller, Thomas Reed, most of my source says, a native of English in County Tyrone, surgeon in the Royal Navy, records how in 1822, at the market of Tulum in County Galway, he encountered a custom, quoting now, for women who can speak English to wear coloured ribbons in their hair, caps or bonnets. Its purpose being that a stranger unacquainted with the vernacular tongue might know to whom he should address himself. And then there's the once popular anecdote, and you heard, where the English-speaking tourist, Irish tourist on the continent in the 50s, let's say, and you know, there weren't that many English speakers on the continent, was having difficulties I think that the person involved was having difficulty in getting an English speaker to give, to get directions from, and she eventually was successful. The surprise stranger asked her, 
How did you know I spoke English? I said, oh, I saw you were wearing the phone. <laughs> That's part of the Dublin wish, I can believe. <laughs> you see the irony of it all. <laughs> but the effect of the, of the fauna was to boost the morale. And we had one account. We were tired working with no visible results for our work. And some people were thinking that it would be best to dissolve the Gaelic League and found another society. The effect was that great glory who used to begin conversations with a few words in Irish and then switch to English, changed their tune, and Irish was to be heard throughout the city again. We all became courageous, and we started to think that we might be able to revive Irish again, no matter how black a position she was in. So the, the underlying thing that was not specifically said is that, seemingly, to, you know, to hear Irish public, uh, spoken publicly is the, is the threshold, it's a threshold in a way, that Irish is used, you know, Irish speaking, anybody who speaks Irish speaks it on themselves, but they went, Norm, very often it would be with people who know each other, so it would be an informal situation. Now, a few practical things. Um, to get a phone, yeah, you had to pass a strict, you had to be sponsored by two members, you had to undergo a strict examination, and the result would not be given to you immediately. If you were successful, you paid your money, two and six for a brass phone, seven and six for a gold phone. You completed a formal questionnaire, apparently. And you came then became before a full meeting of the Gastra, and then Oh, well, you took the vow solemnly, and then you can see how the, um, the fauna grew. And Irish and all, and they seem to have had enough money to, I know it's not my remit today, they seem to have had enough money to have at least one person employed. And Seamus, so I'm sorry, yeah, Seamus uh, over here in Moira, uh, worked for them in the 20s, and um, Martin O'Kind, I think, he came out of prison in the so that shows they were sort of anti-treaty. Um, now, originally it had been hoped that there wouldn't be any split, but in fact, um, that's really not how, not how it happened. Um, just before I come to that, I might say that uh, there are a couple of indications of how things were happening at a social level. And there used to be a thing, an advertisement in the South there, love stories begin at Chabad. Was it up there? I remember there was a nightclub in, Dub nightclub in Dublin where but you could say that some obviously began at the Gospel of the Fauna, because there's one example of Arthur Rian, who was secretary to Owen McNeil. He, he was president of one Gospel, and the lady he married had eight children together then, was secretary of the same Gospel. On the other hand, as early as 1918, be it, there was a letter in uh, Fauna and Lay from a, a lady um, saying that she, Colleen Gon Heal, was the pen name she used, she was having difficulty that she'd been quite friendly with a fauna or somebody who wore the fauna locally and they had been used to speaking Irish together. He had now married a bear lord, an English speaker, and the said English speaker was apparently not taking too kindly to the conversations in Irish between her new husband and this lady. So they were, <laughs> the fauna was bringing always these social <laughs> interactions which are interesting. Now, as I was saying, the, despite the hope that um, the fauna could uh, escape the fallout from the treaty and the, the civil war and so forth. That didn't really happen, at least not in the beginning. And Daisley, who we saw was splendid in the Free State uniform there, um, he stood to one side. He left the Conra and, and the fauna as an active member. Although he stayed, he was very interested in drama, so he stayed in the Corps of Amirta, and he became active in the group later on. And then, as, as things can happen, he got invited then to a meeting in the 1930s about the fauna of all things by Tygo O'Sconnell, who mentioned earlier. And he created a case for me, and he went along. But I don't know this particular work in H.G. Wells' novel, The History of Mr. Polly, you may get something we get the reference. But anyway, he, he's, he's now, you remember, he's 6, 10, 16 years on. Well, his idea, but he's now going to a meeting where somebody is promoting the fauna. That it was a curious re entry into the atmosphere in which I once lived and made me realize how my outlook has changed, how all things have changed for me. What once I loved now moves my scorn, that's the quote from Wells. Today I find myself quoting Mr. Polly. There's no going back to that. So he felt, he went back to the meeting, he felt, it's just kind of strange that he wasn't part of that anymore. Interesting. It's like leaving a religion or something. You know, this is something you go back to. And although he had announced in 1963 that Anfonia had failed to increase the speaking of Irish, 
He actually was present then in Shelburne on the 24th of May 1965 when a Newell was launched um, and papers carried. Um, reports of that, and there's a photograph of him in a new, in a new the Irish language paper. And um, then on the, the headquarters, this is one of the headquarters of the Fawn building, the offices, they put this up. And uh, I wonder if they have a copy of it, but apparently there was a ring around it, so it represent the gold ring to represent the Fawn. So it's the normal blue plaques you may have seen them in the south. But I remember actually passing that. Years ago, I don't know when, but the house, had, the house had been knocked down. Now I don't think he actually lived in it; it was sort of his office. But it was in, I think it was Parnell Square. The house was knocked down, and all that remained, this level was the plaque, and whatever was holding up the plaque. And it says "Chalk Pierce Spade," and I said, "Well, whatever's here, it's not Chalk Pierce Spade." <laughs> um, and it just it struck me that probably what had happened was that the guys who were knocking stuff down didn't know Irish, and like most of them, they knew they didn't know it. They were afraid that they didn't know it was obvious, like they were leaving, you know. So. so we come to the end of our story on the beginning, on the origin of the fauna. So the 1916 fauna went on and would have continued up to the late 50s. By then, Pogo and Oshun and Gradia and Irish people in general thought that it was time to give another lease of life to the fauna idea, and the fauna new and fauna was brought in in the 60s. That's another story. So thank you very much.